In this video, I'd like to show you how to shoot an interview as a one-man band. Now, over the past 10 years, I've traveled all over the world filming interviews for broadcast, TV, commercials, and corporate. And one thing that always remains true is that the interview is the backbone of any video. So in this video, I'd like to show you six simple steps that I've broken down to help you shoot more professional and cinematic looking interviews. When it comes to an interview, one of the first things I think about is the location. So I like to recce a few different locations to find somewhere that's ideal. So when I go into any location, there are three things that I look for in particular. The first is the audio. I like to make sure there are no background hums like air conditioners or background music. The lighting, I want to be in control of the house lights so I can switch them off if I need to. And set dressing. And you can see this place is really cluttered at the moment, but we can do a lot with it. We can clear the space and that's what we need. Next thing I'm going to be looking for is my camera placement and my frame. So I'm going to make the most of the space. I'm going to have my camera far back from the wall. I'm going to be having my subject somewhere around here in the middle and that's going to help create a nice shallow depth of field with a soft background. So the further they are away from the wall, the easier it's going to be for me to create that soft background look. So there's a number of challenges when you're working as a one-man band. You've got a lot more to do yourself, but it's important that you focus on the things that really matter. So for one, you want to get rid of any rubbish. And at the end of the day, the only thing that really matters is what you're going to see in the frame. The next thing is to put the interviewee, put the subject in place. So Panya, who we're going to be interviewing today, if you'd sit here, and a distance her nice and far away from the back wall. I don't want to be capturing the ceiling or the floor in this shot. I want to have a, a look almost like she's in a spotlight with a black wall behind. So I'm going to need a longer lens. That's the next thing. What I can do here is I can move the camera in closer to get a tighter shot, but that means being on a wider lens. And in doing that, you're going to see more of the background. Whereas if I come further back, and I'm on a tighter lens, then it's going to compress the background and I'm going to see less of what's around her, which is what I want for this shot. One of the big challenges working as a one-man band is that you need to be checking on the camera and talking to the subject. So I'm going to be positioning myself as close to the camera and as close to the lens as I can, which also means that the subject's going to be looking almost directly into the center of the camera, into the lens which is a good look. I'm going to be sat right next to the camera, as close to the lens as I can, and I'm going to ask the interviewee to speak directly to me. So the other thing is I want the subject's eye line to be level with the camera, and also level with my eye line as well. It's going to look more natural. We don't want to be looking up at them or down on them. We're going to get a better look if we're at the same level. OK, so I'm fairly happy with the A camera now and the framing of that. So one of the best things you can do is have a second camera it's going to give you a more professional look, and it's going to make your life a lot easier in the edit. Without a second camera, the problem you face is that if the subject hasn't learned their lines, or they're not saying exactly what you want them to say, your edit's going to struggle. You're going to have to jump cut between sentences, and it's going to look messy. The advantage of having a second camera is that you can get creative, and you can stitch the sentences together, and you have a lot more control in your edit. One of the things that's very important that will help with the edit as well is making sure that your shot sizes are very different. On my A camera, I've got a nice mid shot. On my B camera, I'm going to go for a wider shot. Now, I have the A camera as a mid shot because I want to be able to see their face. I want to see them looking at the viewer. Whereas this B camera on the wider shot, it's just going to help creatively give us some options and it's something to cut away to. It's not really the main focus of the film. Something important to keep in mind at this point is the 180 rule which is where you need to draw an imaginary line between yourself, where you're going to be sitting, and the subject, and keep both of your cameras on one side. If I was to put a camera over to the other side of the line, then I'm going to have the subject looking one way in one shot and another way in another. Draw a line between you and the subject and keep both of your cameras on one side. Top tip is whenever you're shooting an interview, always ask your interviewee to bring a change of clothing, a couple of options to wear on the top half. It's really useful. So you can see here, black background, dark grey top, not a good idea. So I asked her to bring a change, and this is a much better look. This is what we need. So happy with the camera setup. We've got both in position. Next thing is the lighting. For this, we're going to do a basic three-point lighting setup. So we're going to have a key light, a fill light, and a backlight. So the first thing I'm going to do is set up my key light. So this is the Aperture 300X, which is a bicolor light. Super useful, because you can change it between daylight and tungsten. I'm just putting this crate on here, which is very useful because it will stop, stop a lot of spill. It will just make sure the light's a bit more directional. I like having a big soft light for an interview. 
always makes the subject look good. So once the crate's on, I'm going to add some more diffusion. Something always worth having is an extension cord. Too many times I've forgotten it. So I've got my key light set up, but before I do anything, I'm going to turn off the house lights so I can really see what this light is doing. So nice thing about this light, you can change the color temperature. So we can go from warm tungsten up to nice blue daylight. And what I'm going to do at the moment is I'm going to keep everything at 5,600 Kelvin, which is roughly daylight. And just going to make sure that all the lights are at the same color temperature. OK, so happy with the key light. Now I'm going to be putting in the fill light, which is just to kind of lift the other side of the face. My fill light, I've got a basic LED panel. Again, it's bicolor, which is handy, so I can set it to daylight, and it will match the other light. So I'm going to have a quick look what that looks like without the house lights on. So that's just key light. And as we bring in the fill light, you can see just lifting the other side of the face a little bit. And now the backlight. The purpose of the backlight is just to give a little bit of a fill on the back of the head and shoulder. It lifts the subject from the background, makes it look uh, a little less flat, brings them away from the wall. I like to angle the backlight in line with the key light, but from the other side of the subject. It just adds a little lift on the back of the subject, brings them away from the wall, and makes the shot more dynamic. And I've gone with a tungsten backlight here just for creative effect. It just adds a little bit of color, a little bit of something extra into the shot. Okay, so this is what it looks like with no lights on. Now we've got our key light on. We'll put the fill light on and the backlight. We'll see how that looks. Okay, so we've got the camera set up. Everything's in position and happy with the lighting. Now the next thing is to run through some checks on the camera to make sure the camera is set up correctly. First thing I'm gonna be looking at is the aperture or the f-stop. So I like to shoot an interview at a low aperture around 2.8. That's the sweet spot for an interview. If you go any lower, down to sort of f2, you run the risk of them moving out of focus when they move their head. And a higher aperture number, like f6.3, 7.1, you can see we're not letting much light into the lens, but a lot more is going to be in focus. So f2.8 is a good sweet spot for an interview like this. So the next thing I'm going to check is the framing. And you can see this shot is looking OK, but it's not great. I don't think it's particularly nice to show someone's lap in shot. And I want to make this shot a little bit more intimate. So I'm going to come in so it's sort of from the top of her head down to her waist. One of the things to look out for is not to give too little or too much headroom. So too little headroom, and you'll be giving them a haircut. Too much headroom, and makes them look a little bit small in frame. In addition to this, the rule of thirds is a really nice way to help you frame your image. Simply put, you draw two imaginary lines across the horizontal and two down the vertical. And the points where the lines meet are the sweet spots. One option there would be to have my subject on a third looking into the empty space. It's much nicer than if it were the other way around. If she were looking into the closed side of the frame, it would look quite uncomfortable. So that can be a, a creative choice. The next thing to sort out is the exposure. Now, when it comes to consumer cameras, like the 5D, you're only going to have a histogram. It's not a very accurate way to be able to, to correctly expose your image. And then when you move over to professional cameras, like the FS5 here, you're going to get more advanced features. And one, this is one of the things you're really paying for. You're going to get things like waveform, which really help you set your exposure correctly. So we've got an external monitor here, which will show us the waveform. So waveform is a representation of your image, the light levels of your image on a graph going from left to right. So you can see in the middle here is our subject. And on the left, we've got 0 to 100 IRE, which is a percentage exposure level. The ideal place to position your subject is at around 60 IRE. And our background is falling into darkness back here. In many interview setups, what I'll do is I'll try and keep my subject around 60 IRE and have my background about 20% lower than that. So the background on 40, the subject on 60. But in this situation, we're going for something a little bit more creative. We want the background a lot darker than the subject. The next setting is the shutter speed. And simply put, you want your shutter speed to be twice your frame rate. So for me, at the moment, I'm shooting at 25 frames a second. So I'm just going to set my shutter to 50. Simple. 
The next thing I'm going to set is the ISO, or ASA as it's also called, which is the sensitivity of the sensor. For the FS5 in the picture profile I'm in at the moment, I'm going to leave it at 640. As you increase the ISO, you're going to be making the sensor more sensitive to light, but you're going to be increasing the grain. So ideally, you want to set your ISO to the native camera setting. What you want to do is check your camera, find out what the ideal ISO is for your camera, and keep it at that. The next thing I look for when adjusting my image are filters. The one most important filter is the ND filter, neutral density filter, and that just limits the amount of light that's reaching the sensor. With consumer cameras like the Canon 5D, it doesn't have any built-in filters, so you're going to have to buy them separately. Whereas with the Sony FS5, it's got a built-in ND filter. If I've got too much light coming in, and I don't want to adjust my other settings, if I don't want to be changing my ISO, my shutter speed, or my aperture, then I can simply dial in the ND filter, and we're good to go. The next thing to get right is the white balance, or the color temperature. At the moment, I haven't set my white balance, so it's looking a little bit orange. It doesn't really matter whether your lights are tungsten or daylight, as long as they're all the same, and you white balance correctly. So you want to make sure that you white balance where your subject is, in front of the lights. So I'm going to ask my subject just to hold a white balance card. It needs to fill the frame. Rather than moving the white card closer to the camera, I'm going to move the camera closer to the white card. OK, so white balance correctly. I'm just going to put the camera back where it was. So it's a lot to think about as a one-man band. There are a lot of little things to get right. But just before you hit record, make sure the subject's in focus. One of the great things about using a camera like the FS5 is it's got a feature called peaking, which will give you a colored outline around the subject, which will make sure they're in focus. Very useful when you're using a consumer-grade camera like the 5D doesn't have peaking, so you've got to do it by eye. You've got to make sure you get it right, and that's very important. OK, so the camera's set up, and I'm happy with the settings. But there's one last thing, a last question that I like to ask myself before I move forward. And that is, is there anything I can do to make the shot more interesting? I'll look at the background, I'll look at the framing, the headroom, the subject, and just see if there are any details that I can improve to make the shot more interesting. So when it comes to audio, when you're working as a one-man band, it really depends on what's practical and what you can afford. And best case scenario, if you can, I like to have a redundancy. I like to have two options. I like to have the lapel mic on the subject, and I like to have a shotgun mic, like the Rode NTG series, which is a great microphone for this. You can pick up a boom pole pretty cheaply, and then you just need an adapter to be able to attach it to a light stand or a C stand. But the microphone itself, it's worth spending a little bit more money on. You want to place the microphone at a 45 degree angle to your subject, not pointing directly at their mouth. You actually want it pointing a little bit lower so that if they lean forward and when they're moving around, you're still going to catch them. If you have it pointed directly at their mouth and then they lean forward in shot, you're going to miss them. So I've got this microphone pointed down towards her chest. Next thing I'm going to do is check that the microphone isn't in shot. It's quite tight on the A camera which is ideal. Now we're going to set up the lapel mic, which is going to be attached to the subject. And I love to use these Rycote overcovers, undercovers, and stickies. These are little sticky tabs that go over the microphone, and it means you can attach it to the inside of the subject's shirt. Either goes on the skin or on their shirt, and that's what I'm wearing now. For an interview like this, a microphone shotgun mic above the subject is ideal because they're not going anywhere and you're going to get really good, reliable audio. But if there's anything else, if they're moving around the room, definitely consider having one of these. And what it suggests is if you drop this down through your top and put the receiver in your pocket, always make sure that there are no phones in either of their pockets, and also to put the receiver in the front pocket so it's got the best signal from them to the camera. Best place to lapel microphone just here in the middle of the chest, not off to one side. You don't want it too high up. It's not going to be able to hear her. So round about there in the middle of the chest. So when you're working with consumer cameras and DSLRs, you're not going to have professional grade inputs like these XLRs here. So when you're working with one of these, you're going to need an external recorder, which means that you can record with XLR inputs. And then you're going to have to sync it up in post, which is another stage to your workflow. Not ideal. It's not too much hassle. With a professional camera like this, the advantage is you've got the XLR input. It records directly into the camera, and you don't have that extra stage in post-production where you've got to sync everything up, which is perfect. OK, so everything's set up. We're nearly good to go. Now the final thing is just to check the audio, test the levels, 
So I'm going to ask the subject a couple of questions just to ease the tension, get them talking. OK, I'm happy with the audio levels. I'm going to hit record on the B camera. I'm going to dim the house lights, and we're good to go. So I'm going to be doing another video at a later date on how to shoot an interview in terms of what questions to ask and how to get the best from your subject. But right now, here are four fundamentals when shooting an interview. So number one is to ask the subject to repeat the question in the answer. So tell me about the video this is mastering. I really like it because I find that... That's no use to me. Whereas if they say... So tell me about the video this is mastering. What I enjoy most about Video Business Mastery is how much I've learned in such a short amount of time. Then you've got a usable soundbite in your edit. The next tip is to leave a silence after they speak. So you ask them a question, they give their answer. Pause, don't say anything. It really focuses on the business side of filmmaking. And that leads me on to my third tip, which is don't interrupt. And resist the urge to say um or ah or yeah or try and encourage them verbally. Instead, my fourth tip is use nonverbal cues. Instead of interrupting them, which is going to ruin your audio, just a little head nod or a hand gesture, that goes a long way. And it helps them feel like you're engaged in the conversation, even though you're not speaking. Since taking the Video Business Mastery course, I've been able to land higher paying clients. I've been able to get consistent work. And as a result of this, my business has just grown from strength to strength. It's helped me better price my own services. I was undervaluing myself. Something that I haven't actually found anywhere else is that Video Business Mastery really focuses on the business side of filmmaking. It's actually taught me to take the attention away from making something really pretty and cool and actually putting focus on what the client needs. And in turn, because I've helped the client get what they need, they have then come back to me over and over. So there you have an overview of how I shoot an interview as a one-man band. I hope you found the video helpful and that you've learned some things and you can implement some of these steps into your own filmmaking. If you're interested in learning more about the business of video production and how to run your own video production company, then check out the free one-hour filmmaking training that I'll leave in the description below. Make sure you hit the subscribe button so that you can catch the next videos when they're released over the coming weeks and months, and I'll see you then.